Hey everyone, thanks for tuning in today. I'm Nicole Forbes with Dennis's 70s, and today we are talking about tomatoes and how to grow the best tomatoes at home. It is um, something I'm passionate about. Just gonna tell you to, you know, alter your expectations for me to talk about juicy, homegrown, heavy yielding, heirloom versus hybrid tomatoes. I'm so excited that um, it's months away before we can actually eat tomatoes, but planting them, um, you know, it's, well, that's the first step, right? So people really put a lot of hopes and dreams into growing their uh, best flavored tomatoes at home. And I, I'm, I'm right along with you. I probably care more about them than almost any other edible crop that I grow in my garden. And I probably grow more tomatoes than I grow of almost any other crop in my garden. But it's important to be, it's important to study tomatoes, to kind of put your all into it when you grow them because you only get one shot a year. I can grow lettuce over and over and over again every season and you know water more water less fertilize more use slug bait improve my lettuce game throughout the season with multiple opportunities to grow lettuce but honestly at least here in the portland oregon pacific northwest we plant tomatoes right around mother's day and we pull them out around frost um, or you know by halloween usually they're wrapping up so one time, one shot, the learning curve is steep. And tomatoes, I would love to say that they're easy to grow, but they're not the hardest, they're right in the middle. They are um, slightly demanding in their like pre-planting preparation. Tomatoes grow fairly fast, and so again, being able to handle uh, their growth either with proper supporting, uh, proper spacing, or optional pruning. Um, just takes a little bit extra skill than like plant it and forget it, which you can do with, uh, uh, honestly, lettuce is one of those that's pretty darn easy. Plant it and forget it. Peas, another one. Until they're ripe, you know, there's not much to do with the pea. It's pretty self-contained. <clears throat> but tomatoes, not only is there a little bit of... Uh, what you put into it in the beginning, you know, what you get out of it. Uh, this is possibly the case of the $10 hole, you know, um, if you know what I mean. Not only is there some information that we're gonna share today about what to use in your planting preparation and how to plant the tomatoes and when to plant the tomatoes, but which tomatoes to plant? Because, oh my gosh, there's hundreds of varieties of tomatoes to choose from. And if you have just come to the West Coast from the East Coast, many of the varieties of tomatoes perhaps that you grew up with or you're familiar with in another part of the country, you won't even find available any longer because, well, because we got West Coast tomatoes. So um, learning the varieties, learning to read a tag, to give you the information that's provided here on the plant you know itself so that you don't have to pull up google or consult uh you know an encyclopedia to find out more about your plants so we're going to run through all of these things and um like i said i'm always so excited about this so uh first off where do you put your tomatoes well the growing conditions for tomatoes are um fairly simple to kind of just lay out they need full sun Tomatoes want at least six hours of direct sun throughout the day uh, while they're growing. So that's gonna be, like I said, from mid-May until Halloween, that spot where that tomato is, the sun better shine on it for at least six hours. Could be more. Tomato will be fine with that. If you have less than six hours. Now, if you have one hour, you're not gonna grow a tomato. If you have four hours, perhaps, or all day long, of filtered light and not strong sun, you can grow some tomatoes, but what you're gonna grow are cherry tomatoes. So kind of typical is the size of the fruit will indicate 
the hours of sun required. Bigger, bigger, bigger fruit, all the sun you can give them. Cherries, though, you can get away with in four hours of sun. So that's good news for those of you that thought maybe you couldn't grow a tomato in partial sun. Not a beefsteak, though, um, but saladettes, cherries, currant tomatoes, grape tomatoes. Um, there's some really great cherry style or small cluster type tomatoes, and often they are among the most productive in general of all of the tomatoes. They start early and produce long, so those cherry tomatoes give you um, a long season of harvest on a regular basis. Like every other day, you could be out, you know, filling your shirt pocket with tomatoes. Um, and perfect portable size, little cherry tomatoes, right? So, sorry, see, I get so excited about this. So the time of year is also important. Full sun, right? Second is, when, when's the green light? How do we know? Well, there's a couple of ways to tell. You can look at the calendar and pretty safely plant your tomatoes on or anytime shortly after Mother's Day weekend. That's early to mid-May. And here in the Pacific Northwest, the conditions should be right for us right around that time. This is a crap spring. Uh, it is cold. It has been a long, cold, wet winter. And so we are slowly warming up in our soil temperature and our air temperature this year. Nighttime temperatures for the next 10 days. I'm always looking at the 10 day ahead forecast. It's always changing way out there, but really pretty consistently, the 10 day forecast is still showing nighttime temperatures in the mid to upper 40s. And I know that that means that it's still not likely that we've got the conditions for planting tomatoes just by that 10-day forecast. Now, beyond that, you can go a little bit more scientific, which mm, I like science. This is the best tool ever. Uh, this is a soil thermometer. And I mean, come on, right? You've got thermometers in your refrigerator. You've got a thermometer in your oven, probably. We've got thermostats in our house. We read the outside uh, temperature, maybe from, you know, wherever to tell what, what to wear today. A soil thermometer goes down into the ground in your garden, pushes down till the little green knot is right at the soil line. And then in three to five minutes, you can pull this out of the soil and read it just like a regular thermometer um, that you would take your own temperature. Now, the difference of this one, not only is it in like a heavy duty metal casing, but the range on this thermometer goes from negative 10 degrees to 120 degrees Fahrenheit. So it gives you a really wide range. Human thermometers um, have like a 20 degree range or something like that. So um, don't go through your medicine cabinet and try to pull out your own thermometer. It's measuring in the 90s, you know. Uh, this one, like I said, negative 10 to 120 degrees. And soil can, well, I've never been down to negative 10, amen to that, because we're in Portland, Oregon, but wherever you are, gosh, you could be down like that. The, the biggest criticism that I have of this absolutely wonderful tool that's like 14 bucks for you to buy at the garden center and super durable is that this green top is a ridiculous color to lose in your garden. I mean, I guess it was their only way of ensuring that you would maybe buy two in your lifetime because otherwise they're super durable. But the green top makes them disappear once you've got them amongst plants and I've lost them multiple times and I want to pull it up and read my soil temperature every day because that's what I do. And so paint it with your brightest nail polish or um, hazard paint, you know, or whatever you've got, bright red, bright yellow, something like that because, oh my gosh, it's too easy to lose. But the back of this reads like a straight up list. If you pull the thermometer out, temperature says X, this is what you can plant right now. Or you can basically pull that thing out and wait and wait and wait for a daily reading, at least five days consistent of 60 degree soil. And after we've had a week of soil that reaches that 60 degrees or more, then we can plant our tomatoes into that soil. If we, so I was just talking to a woman who heard me say, well, it's not tomato weather yet. And she was like, well, if I cover, can I just cover them? 
Well, in, in many cases, if we were worried about freezing frost, covering them would, would prevent them from damage of, you know, frost coming down on them. But we're talking about the literal earth. <laughs> the temperature of the earth needs to rise in order for these plants to be comfortable nestled into that soil. And if we put tomatoes into, there's really not much you can do to warm up the earth. I mean, that's the sun's job. Raised beds and containers can warm up faster. Anything that's up and above the ground can warm up faster when we have that stretch of warm days, five days of sun, sunny weather and not too cold at night. That pot or raised bed will achieve a closer match to airtime temperature. Airtime. Air temperature. That was a combo of daytime and air. Um, you'd speak my language. But in the ground, it takes a little bit longer to eventually get to that 60 degrees. Now, um, if you have mulch over your garden beds, like a heavy layer of straw or um, bark or any other kind of mulch chips, if you pull your mulch back and expose the bare soil to the spring sun, it'll warm up just a little bit faster as well. So we can wait until our tomatoes have been in a little bit and we're like warming up it consistently and starting to be drier and water them more. Then we put the mulch on to like insulate in that nice warm temperature and hold the moisture in. But right now too much mulch will actually keep your soil colder and slow it down from warming up. But the soil thermometer, magic wand. I'm not going to put my plants in until it's at least 60 degrees because tomatoes are so wimpy to cold. They are like, they're like cold blooded and they, and they go into the cold soil and they, they, their, their little, their little roots go numb and then their stems get cold and then their little leaves want to curl and then they feel so cold that like they can't, they can't warm up. Even when the summer sun and warms them up, they're like stunted from that experience, that early childhood trauma that you put them through. And so if we planted a tomato today, this guy, if we, what are you, celebrity? No, you're short. If we planted this tomato today, chocolate cherry, gorgeous, happy, tall looking, spry tomato that has been undercover in the greenhouse here we planned this today <clears throat> and in two weeks we planted this tomato and they are like equal so today they are the same size but in two weeks if we planted a tomato that's the same size as the one we planted two weeks previous the later planted tomato would catch up to and ultimately grow larger than the tomato that was planted early on in cold soil. Its growth can be stunted and like literally retarded to, to the entire season. So better to wait. Uh, and in some cases, you know, even uh, a disadvantage of planting early. <clears throat> now, as I mentioned, raised beds and all these other kinds of great situations that you may have, you could have your tomato planting area in a microclimate. Maybe you've got it covered with black plastic and heat lamps on it and you're running whatever a higher temperature in your soil fine you can plant then so you want you know again your conditions um, to match the tomatoes conditions and you can find that out by checking your 10-day forecast pulling the soil temperature and just kind of you know gauging on average where our frost is and all of those kinds of things now we can put them in the ground or we can put them in containers Tomatoes can grow uh, in a pot that literally gets wheeled around so that it follows the sun throughout the day. We've got um, large pots and rolling casters with locking wheels and you could push it around throughout the afternoon as the sun traveled around your property to give it eight hours of sun. If you're that dedicated to a tomato, um, then you deserve to have a good harvest. And so, of course, that's an option for you. It's a little much for most of us. Um, I believe that probably in the future, like um, um, what's the, the vacuum thing? The, the, we'll have the little like robots 
that could probably move our plants around for us to follow the sun. I mean, why wouldn't it, right? A little solar panel and a little, uh, anyways, that's probably coming, but for now, you'll have to move your plant around in the sun itself. If you're putting it in a pot, you wanna use potting soil, but a high quality potting soil. Um, see how carried away I get? Again, there's a handout. All of this information, all these details, even suggested varieties of tomatoes to use, uh, a planting recipe, which is our like standard, what you put in the hole, is all on a blog handout that is attached to this video right up at the very top when it says, welcome to our tomato class. You'll see a link there that's to the class handout. If you have trouble finding it, please mention it in the comment section and we will link it directly to you. And if you have specific questions that I do not answer in today's video, um, please also write those in the comments. And after the class video is over, uh, I will make an effort to answer any of those questions out there. <clears throat> Regular potting soil is good, uh, like a premium soil, full of nutrition to get a plant started. But it's not what a potting soil, even a premium potting soil contains is not enough to sustain a plant through the entire season. So whether we add soil amendments and compost into our planting hole in the ground, in raised beds, in a container, the soil that we put in and the amendments, as I said, such as you'll see on the handout compost, like Malibu, this is an absolutely fantastic biodynamic, all organic compost, uh, where you don't, use, you don't use a ton of it, um, so a shovel full in a hole, that kind of thing, little goes a long ways. Even in your potting soil, uh, compost is a great amendment to enhance the soil. And another of my favorite amendments to use, both in the ground and in containers, is worm castings. <coughs> worm castings are, wor uh, are worm castings is worm poop i don't know somebody give me a linguist uh you know assist on that linguist assist uh worm castings worm poop it is um odorless delightful it looks like dried coffee grounds it is full of micronutrients trace elements it has some nitrogen in it uh the microbes and probiotics uh, that your soil needs. This is food for those probiotics. So uh, worm castings are fabulous for that. And uh, it's got some wonderful kind of side effects, including some slight insecticidal properties by a uh, component called chitinase, which is inside the worm castings themselves. Worm castings have kind of a slightly aggregate effect. And so they can also, that means that they can help bind pieces of your soil together into kind of chunkier bits so that you know like like a like a crumbled brownie mix you know that's what we want our soil to look at look like not like sandy dry bleh. so uh, the aggregation can be helped by your worm castings and that starts to pull it together in more of the brownie bits instead of the bleh. so <clears throat> amendments what goes in, um, in addition to, or your options are, of course, compost, as I mentioned, the worm castings, it's a must, and it can be with compost. And then there's a product called Harvest Supreme, which is a soil building or soil conditioner product that we use that has 15% chicken manure added to it. So it's got a little kick with the chicken manure. It helps to break up our clay soil if you've got some heavier soil so that tomatoes, little fine roots, have a better chance of kind of working their way in. And that 15% chicken manure is just kind of perfect for our little heavy feeding tomatoes to get, you know, welcomed into the garden with some water soluble, pretty quick to release nutrition that will, like I said, help them, you know, get themselves established and start to take off right away. <clears throat> now, what size container is what I've off, I'm always asked. Uh, if, if you're planting in the garden, you know, you've got, for most tomatoes, you're looking at about a two to three foot apart spacing on average. 
I try to at least plant my tomatoes three feet apart. I'd like to be able to get around them if I have to. I want better airflow between the tomatoes. And um, I don't want to miss a single ripe one, you know? So if the tomatoes are too close together, sometimes you can't even see the goods that the tomatoes got going on and you have to claw through all of that big foliage to find your fruit. So I'd rather, like I said, kind of have access all around and tomatoes are better off given proper spacing than being really um, crammed together. So in the ground, three feet for me, two to three feet, I guess for you. And if you're growing determinate or smaller, more compact varieties of tomatoes, you could go to that two foot spacing. <clears throat> in the ground, or excuse me, in containers. And when I say in the ground, really that's the same as in your raised beds, right? So if you're in a raised bed, you're still going to go that two to three feet apart to give the plant ample spacing. In containers, it depends on the size of the tomato and its growth habit on what size pot you are actually going to use. <clears throat> and so that gets us into a little bit of detail that can often be found on the label. Let's see if I can do this. So on a label, on a tomato tag, something like uh, Celebrity here, which I, I, I poo-pooed, I put it down earlier. I said, no, it's too short. Well, Celebrity is too short because this is a short tomato plant. It's a determinate variety. So determinate means that it stays short and compact, two to three feet tall. Celebrity is actually a um, hybrid tomato, so it's not an heirloom, it's a hybrid. This one has disease resistance as well, so we'll talk about again, um, if you've had disease in your soil or trouble with tomatoes, choosing hybrids with disease resistance is a smart uh, way to go. <clears throat> but being a determinant and the word determinant you'll see both on the handout but also on the tags of most tomatoes determinant tomatoes stay short and compact two to three feet and they tend to yield their harvest over a three week period and then they're done for the season so they kind of ripen all at once and then they wrap it up and you could um, take them out of the pot and put them in the compost and plant something else because they're smaller determinant tomatoes they could go in a smaller container. So something like a five gallon nursery pot. Uh, this happens to be a 14 inch plastic pot. Uh, <clears throat> so 14 inches at the top and probably about 14 inches from top to bottom, even though it tapers at the bottom. This is gonna hold about a cubic foot of garden soil. So a one cubic foot bag, plus our handfuls of like warm castings and the uh, Harvest Supreme and some of our fertilizer that we're going to put in there and this would be fine for a shorter growing or determinant sized tomato but again only one per pot. The other type of tomato, the big tomato, tomatoes are indeterminant. So we have determinant or indeterminate. Indeterminate tomatoes are viney with a tall kind of upward growing habit and often long viney branches that could get up to six feet and even on up to like 18 20 feet long if you grew them on a trellis panel for example and stretched the vines on a horizontal you would see a tomato plant that could get up to like i said up to 15 18 20 feet <coughs> but most of us end up with tomatoes that are about six feet tall. The indeterminate varieties of tomatoes absolutely need support in the garden. So whether that is, like I said, some sort of uh, trellis panel that you train them to, most of us are using a tomato cage, which could be as simple, oh, I knew that was gonna happen. <clears throat> it could be as simple as the classic cone-shaped cage, which of course, uh, awkward, goes into the ground with those pointy tips down. Um, the smaller cages, and believe it or not, that is kind of one of the smaller cages. The smaller cages are great, again, for smaller growing tomatoes. I like to use, let's see if I can still do this. 
I like to use a taller cage uh, for most of my tall growing tomatoes. And the cage I like is this square collapsible tomato cage. So in the off season, you can set these cages in uh, you know, a storage area and many of them will stack up together uh, to stay you know, free and able to be used the following year. And then once you've planted your tomato, you put this cage down on the ground and it actually is only about four feet tall. So like I said, if you've got six foot tomatoes, they are gonna still come out the top of the cage um, you can always go for a taller cage, but these uh, are just fantastic and a good size for most people. <clears throat> and I like that storage ability. Oh, I talk about tomato cages too, and then I'll go back to pot size. Hummingbirds love to sit on tomato cages. Um, all birds really love to sit on tomato cages, but something about that like gauge of wire, uh, as soon as you have a tomato cage out, you'll find a little hummingbird sitting on it. And that's just like an added bonus of your tomato garden or vegetable garden in the, in the first place. So back to those indeterminate tomatoes, which again, you'll see on a tag. Uh, here I've got Stupus, which right now looks like a short compact tomato, but Stupus will tell us right on the tag that it is indeterminate and so that's our watchword. That means it's going to grow tall, needs to be in a larger pot with a larger cage. Indeterminate tomatoes should go in at least like a 15 gallon container. So 15 gallon pots are gonna hold approximately two cubic feet of garden soil uh, with, you know, two cubic feet of potting soil with those amendments that we talk about um, what you put in the planting hole. This is, I believe, 20 inches. Yeah, so this is 20 inches in diameter, about 20 inches tall, <clears throat> and two feet. So a two cubic foot bag of garden soil. And of course, yeah, this is going to get heavy when it's full of soil. So if you needed to move it around, uh, we've got those wonderful rolling situations that go underneath them. So you don't have to worry about not being able to move your tomato if you needed to, like, I don't know, clean the deck or get past it on your balcony or whatever. So, determinate and determinate. <clears throat> now, fertilizing. Tomatoes are heavy feeders, especially if you're going to grow them in containers. We need to make sure that uh, we use that quality potting soil and then add a slow release organic fertilizer at the time of planting. And in containers, we'll be reapplying that granular fertilizer about every four weeks, maybe six weeks at the longest, because uh, the, the nutrients get kind of flushed out of the soil as we water more and more. And as the tomatoes grow faster, we want them to have that nutrition that they need, uh, and that they rely on for fruit development and plant growth. We have a recipe of what we recommend goes in the planting hole. And again, you will find that on the handout, but it is specific, specific to success with tomatoes, but the same ingredients can be applied to eggplant, squashes, and string beans in addition to tomatoes. And the, the real key is that we load up the hole with calcium. And calcium, we provide a couple of different sources of calcium uh, with organic amendments that include lime, and lime is calcium carbonate. We add bone meal, and bone meal is ground up fish bone, if it's fish bone meal, or cattle bones. Uh, if it's just standard bone meal, it's cattle bones. So that's another source of calcium that's a little slow to release. And then the tomato vegetable herb fertilizer that is made by GNB. We love to use this product for feeding our tomatoes specifically because in addition to its balance of 463, which is perfect for flowering and fruiting vegetables, this product has 10% calcium uh, in it as well. So it supports that calcium requirement of fruit development. The granular fertilizer like this is slow release. It's all organic. It can be applied in the planting hole and then reapplied for in the ground again about every four to six weeks. 
going to give you instructions on the label as far as how much to apply and um, then you just water it in and that gives you that kind of long slow release. Also has the microbes, so the probiotics and the microbes that help feed the soil itself and, and raise the biological activity of the soil which helps other nutrients break down and become more plant available to the tomatoes. Now granular fertilizer is that long slow fertilizing. It's the feed that kind of keeps giving to the plants every day as they need it. But we can also, when the plants are actively growing and really working hard or after planting when we know that soil temperatures are still on the cool side and the the granular fertilizer that we have included in the hole is going to still take some time to break down and become plant available we can feed with a liquid fertilizer to get the plants started and to provide that kind of instant nutrition um, something like the liquid all-purpose that GMB has this is three two three so again lower numbers but a good gentle support for the plants or you could water in your plants with a compost tea as well which will help to stimulate that microbial activity in your garden um, this is a specific blend of compost tea made by Malibu, but for tomatoes, uh, vegetables, and fruits with the biodynamic preparation that um, is recommended by biodynamic gardening techniques. But if you're curious at all about your soil's nutrition, uh, you know, nutrient levels, what you may or may not need to apply to your vegetable garden this season, um, we've also got soil test kits for you to take home and test your own garden soil. So because right now we're looking at a couple weeks, a week and a half before we want to really consider planting our tomatoes out in the garden, this will be a perfect weekend to take a soil test instead of do your planting. And that way you've got a better sense of what nutrients may be present and which may be lacking. That way, as you plant, you can add those amendments or not add amendments that your soil seems to be adequate in. The cost of fertilizer has gone up um, in this last year specifically, as I've mentioned before. It shouldn't affect us nearly as much as it affects like our food farmers and you know actual farmers, but we, we see the price has increased on everything and that now includes you know just trying to keep our lawns green or keep a tomato happy. So. Um, Doing a soil test is smart because again, it can help you to just not randomly apply nutrients just because, just in case, uh, as well as, you know, if you're working on the, the uh, economic scale of growing tomatoes versus what you would buy at the store, for example, um, your inputs and how much you spend on them is a, you know, a part of that formula. So important like i said to know what you need or what you're missing <clears throat> speaking on that like economics of scale an average tomato plant what are you uh san marzano sure this is an average tomato plant san marzano mm, my gosh this is an award-winning paste tomato so most of us know like roma roma tomatoes this is a roma style but san marzano which is ready in 70 to 80 days, is uh, just a more distinct flavor of paste tomato. It is, sometimes even when you buy like tomatoes in the canned paste tomato, you will see specifically San Marzano tomatoes. Um, otherwise, you just see paste tomato in which it's kind of Roma style. But the, gosh, what was I going, what was I talking about? Um, The, where was I going with that? Oh, well. Oh, I know. San Marzano, pretty heavy producer on average. It probably represents kind of the general average yield that a tomato gives. Whew. Now I know, I'm on track again, guys. An average tomato can give you like about 40 pounds of produce throughout its ripening season. So, an early and that but that so that depends a great big tomato may not ripen until mid-august but you've got 
like two pounders coming out or more. So of course it's easier to come out with 20 fruits and you've got your 40 pounds on that guy. Worth, worth a cherry tomato or the smaller fruits, you get a lot more of them to make that, obviously make that 40 pounds. But on average, you can assume 40 pounds uh, per plant yield. Now, when you look at their tags, we go back to the tag, we'll pull, let's pull out uh, Cherokee Purple is a good heirloom tomato tag. So Cherokee Purple, here's our lovely tag with a kind of a, I think that the color is poor on this tag because it just shows like a really washed out fruit. It's not purple like grapes or anything, but Cherokee Purple is sort of a dusky, pinky purple. Even maybe burgundy would be a good color. It's an heirloom tomato. The tag tells us so on the back. So it uh, does say heirloom tomato on the front with the picture. Not all of them have the pictures. Back says heirloom tomato, indeterminate. Okay, we already are starting to know you, you're a big one. You need a big cage and to, you know, gonna grow six feet tall. It tells us that this is large, deep burgundy, eight to 10 ounce fruit, rich, earthy flavor. Up above it, it says matures in 72 days. Now the days to maturity on the tomato are telling us how many days after transplanting, so once it goes in the ground, the clock starts, the calendar starts, whatever. So 72 days after we put it in the ground, we should start having ripe tomatoes. Now, if you look, I mean, here we go back to our San Marzano just for a minute. San Marzano is 70 to 80 days. But if I take a look at the top of this fruit, the top of this plant, it is already, already has a flower cluster forming. It doesn't have open flowers yet, but it already has a flower cluster forming. So even though it's 70 to 80 days after we put it in the ground that we're likely to have a consistent ripening of tomatoes, it may throw out a couple of flower buds, kind of just like trying to gauge whether the conditions are right. These plants have come out of, you know, greenhouses or had different lighting and they measure all of that. The length of the day, length of the night, the temperature to try to figure out when to set their flower buds. Honestly, on something like this one, I would just, the flowers are not going to ripen into a fruit in like, it's not even May yet. So not likely to happen for it. As I planted the San Marzano, I would pinch off this flower bud. And that's just as simple as it's soft and tender growth. I'm just gonna use my fingernail and get in there and take that flower bud off and just tell it, relax, just be a, be a plant, just grow a little bit. And once you've been in for a while and it's warm, then you can make some flowers and start thinking about, you know, raising a family and having some tomatoes. So it's a too early for most of these to be flowering. And if so, the flowers that you see aren't likely to produce anything this early in the season. Looking at those dates though, that tells us, I mean, uh, tomato dates for dates for maturity can be that 70, 72 days, like I said, or all the way over to here is Hawaiian pineapple. Now Hawaiian pineapple, take a look at that beautiful fruit on the tag. This is another heirloom. This is a large beefsteak style tomato. The fruit can be like one and a half pounds in size and weight and we're we're talking 90 95 days to be able to eat this so almost a month after the 70 day for example um, before we've got this large fruit uh tomato heirloom hawaiian pineapple ripe for us worth it and worth waiting for but if all you're planting and you're really, you know, after these long, long weight tomatoes, 85, 90 days, 95 days, then you would be wise to put in at least one or two early season tomatoes so that you're not like waiting months and months to have fruit ripen and you at least have a tomato that you could be eating earlier than that while you're waiting. So I highly suggest if you're doing those 85, 90 day tomatoes, go with something. I mean, the standard early girl, early girl won uh, one of our 
tomato tasting event, one of the last tomato tasting events that we uh, threw here, I think that was 2019. Early girl is um, 54 days. So that is super fast, that's very early. So early girl is um, just a classic red tomato ripe in 54 days. Another of my early favorites, well, Stupus, as I mentioned, so Stupus is indeterminate, two and a half inch, fairly small, not cherry, but still small tomatoes, uh, heavy producer, 55 days. So one day after, one day longer than early girl. And then this is Moscovich, and Moscovich is another great round red. It's a Russian heirloom, so don't boycott Moscovich. It's still a great tomato, and no proceeds are going to Russians uh, at this point. Six to eight ounce red, flavorful fruit, uh, and being a Russian heirloom, this has cold tolerance. Not like I would still plant it out in 49 degree soil, but um, cold tolerance to just like our, our kind of average organ spring, which can be warm or not warm. And another of my, over here, of my favorite favorites for early season is another heirloom called Bloody Butcher. And as I mentioned, early girl, 54 days. Then we had Stupus at 55, Bloody Butcher also, 55 days, and you've got a ripe tomato indeterminate, very early, four ounce tomatoes, uh, deep red fruit, super juicy and great flavor. A four ounce tomato, <clears throat> Bloody Butcher, seems to fit like right on the top of a soda can. So if you're trying to imagine like what's four ounces? Well, imagine a soda can and it's just literally the dimensions of that. I can pick one and like set it right on there and carry it into the house. Uh, Bloody Butcher is as I mentioned, an heirloom has a funny name because a lot of heirlooms have funny names. Heirloom varieties have been around since uh, before 1950. They are varieties that have been, uh, in many cases, uh, cherished by family, passed down from generation to generation in the form of seeds interbred with one another in communities brought from the old country, for example, and are cherished for their flavor and their deep history. Heirloom varieties of tomatoes are not traditionally disease resistant tomatoes. They were bred for flavor. They may be, sometimes they're ugly. Sometimes they are, uh, misshapen or have uh, ribs or ridges in them like a pumpkin would. Um, the range of diversity within heirloom tomatoes is probably one of the most remarkable things about them, both in the range of flavor and complexity of the tomato flavor, as well as their color, their size, uh, and their shape. Heirloom tomatoes, the opposite of, would be hybrid tomatoes. Now, hybrid tomatoes are tomatoes that are purposefully crossed with one another to emphasize two different traits or a specific trait that we want, like early for early girl, or juicy, uh, or red, or in the case of the tomato that we tend to have available to us year-round at the grocery store. It's a tomato that, you know, ripens so-so and kind of quickly turns red, at least, even if it's not ripe, and has a thicker skin and a uniform shape and size so that they can kind of just be predictably packed into boxes and shipped around the, uh, you know, U.S. and not be uh, prone to blemishing or splitting or bruising. So that hybrid focus of our commercial tomato was to emphasize traits that would be advantageous to commercial production. Whereas, again, when we're literally taking the tomato from the backyard or the front balcony into the house, if it's lucky, sometimes, I mean, the first couple of tomatoes, I'm just like, just put them right in my mouth. I won't do it. I sometimes I'll wipe them off, you know, but I know there's nothing on them. They're off the ground. 
I'm so excited to eat them and I've been waiting for days until the perfect moment and I don't want anybody else to beat me to it and I will just take the opportunity and you should too. Life is there for you to grab and eat. So as the fruits developing on the tomatoes, <clears throat> you again will see that kind of either cluster form. So cherry tomatoes tend to ripen in a cluster like grapes. And usually the uh, cluster ripens from the back of the cluster to the front. So the, the, the newest tomato is kind of at the furthest end. So you're picking it from the back to the front. But you can wait for the whole cluster to be ripe in many cases and snip the entire cluster. Tomatoes really do ripen best on the vine but they can ripen somewhat after they've been picked as long as they've at least hit a certain point of color in most cases. <clears throat> but what we don't want to do is water down the flavor or um, dilute the sugars in the tomato by like storing fresh picked tomatoes in the refrigerator. Keep them on a counter. Um, don't put them in the refrigerator. That tends to deteriorate their flavors like right away. So watering, as I mentioned, that's another way that uh, we can impact the flavor of a tomato and is another one of those things that is kind of hard to dial in on your tomato growing um, kind of maintenance or regimen. Clearly, as we talk about in different instances uh, for various topics, where you are growing is going to affect your watering as well. So whether it's in raised beds, which dry out faster, in pots or containers, which, you know, a small pot is going to dry out faster than a big pot, but pots just simply dry out faster and need more consistent watering, more regular watering than, or more frequent, I guess I would say, than in the ground plantings. So watering is best to be done deeply and over a, uh, like, deep and infrequently is the best way I can put it. So ideally at regular intervals, but not, not daily unless it's in a container. And you want a nice deep soaking to encourage those tomato roots to go deep down into the ground. It is uh, a tomato in the middle of the day, once it's in midsummer and it's hot, a tomato is likely to sort of partially wilt it does what we call a midday wilt, where all of the stems and leaves will start to sort of sag and everything will look a little bit droopy and sad. But that's the tomato's way of coping with the stress and the heat of a midday sun. If you see your tomato plants wilting in early morning, that would be a signal that the soil is dry and a good indication to water. But if you know you've watered in the morning and then you see your tomatoes wilting in midday, there's no benefit to watering them. And in fact, you could do damage by just keeping them too moist. So watching again, the time of day that we see that wilt, but a deep soaking on regular intervals, allowing your plants to dry out in between is the most important. It is, An early planted tomato, whether we're planting a one gallon size, which has got a decent root system, a four inch size, which has a pretty small root system right now, or planting a two gallon tomato, which already has a more established root system and a bigger plant. Any of these plants freshly put into the ground, our watering is going to be more frequent but shallow because the roots aren't, uh, the roots are up in the soil surface. But of course, we all ha also have the rain um, to help us with that kind of watering. So once the weather warms and the rain tapers off, that's when your watering really comes into active action. Uh, at least like a slow trickle from the hose dropped right at the base of the tomato in the ground and a good 20 minutes of soaking should be uh, maybe once or twice a week once we get into the active growing season. That's about what I do with my tomatoes. <clears throat> now, you again, you know, will count the intervals. 
in your uh, container plantings, most likely by the time the tomatoes large and we're into the full summer swing, you're gonna be watering your tomatoes in containers every day, um, at best every other day. Raised beds more frequently as well, and in the ground is about that twice a week is ideal, as long as you're giving that deep soak, and then you have mulch on top that reduces the water evaporation. Now, there's not a lot of pests and diseases that bother tomatoes. There's, there are some pests and some diseases. So like I said, not only if you are uh, aware of the presence of diseases in your garden from previous years experience. If last year, your tomatoes did great up until like early August and then they got some weird stuff on the leaves and they all shriveled and died and you pulled them out and you're like, oh yeah, I remember that. Then you would be wise to choose a disease resistant hybrid variety this year instead of going with all of those tempting heirlooms with those fun names. It's more common that rather than true disease, what we see on tomato produce is something called blossom end rot. Now blossom end rot is when the bottom of the tomato, doesn't give me a picture of it, when the bottom of the tomato, like the end opposite the stem, becomes kind of sunken or tough or thicker cells or a gray or brown color. It doesn't make that nice round tomato any longer. It just kind of collapses and um, turns bad colors and looks icky. Blossom end rot is a result of an interruption in the calcium uptake that our plants are experiencing, whether that is cold soil temperatures, which will slow down the breakdown of calcium, whether that is too inconsistent of watering, so the plant goes too dry between watering and then it can't take up calcium, or if we didn't have enough calcium in the planting hole in the first place, that would be a, a deficiency in calcium rather than really the inability to take it up. Calcium, as I mentioned, is in that bone meal, lime, and 10% calcium in our tomato vegetable herb fertilizer. And that's all the reason why we put that down in the planting hole is to avoid the blossom end rot that can be um, to kind of ruin part of your tomato. I mean, you can cut it off and try to eat the rest, but the good news is it's not a disease and it can be corrected even in like in the current season that you're growing. So you can, um, use a product called Foley, if you did not put the calcium in the hole, you can use a product called FolyCal, and this is a liquid form of calcium that can help to treat the blossom end rot. You've got to spray the whole plant, um, but this will help to turn around that process, and then you just remember in the future, uh, follow those directions and put all that good stuff in the hole. If you have other potentially fungal problems, you think you've got a tomato disease like early blight, late blight, bring a sample always in a sealed container like a Ziploc bag uh, into the garden center with maybe even some pictures of your tomatoes and we'll be happy to take a look at the foliage and do our best to diagnose and help you, you know, steer you towards a safe treatment. Pests, there's nothing really specific about tomatoes that brings uh, new pests that you wouldn't have already experienced somewhere else in your garden. There is the tobacco hornworm that occasionally we see. Um, once you see it, it can become, you know, it, maybe it's small, but usually when we find them, it's a big worm and it's already eating the tomatoes and things. So, but that is um, not common, not super frequent. We have early season pests for tomatoes, insect-wise can be flea beetles, which are about the size of a flea, very small, and they kind of jump from the soil line up to plants and uh, leave tiny little, almost like buckshot looking holes in the leaves. Flea beetles are annoying. They can definitely spread disease if we have, again, diseased plants in our garden but they're not the worst, they're not fatal to a tomato. And because tomatoes grow so 
large and so quickly, they eventually grow taller than a flea beetle can even jump. And so typically the damage is down low, uh, the plant grows out of it, and eventually flea beetles aren't that big of an issue anyway. So um, there are products that we can steer you to again that treat flea beetles and other pests that you may experience on aph uh, like aphids. But on average, uh, tomatoes kind of have their own even like protection against pests by being somewhat um, fuzzy. They've got a, a weird smell. They've got a bitter taste. Most um, herbivores like deer don't want to eat them, although they'll eat the tomato fruit. They don't like to eat the tomato leaves. Um, and they've got like uh, terpenes and um, something called trichomes on the leaves that put out sort of weird essential oils and stuff that make them just strange for pests to eat. We also, we don't eat tomato leaves, right? So we just wait for the fruit too. We got that in common with the deer. <clears throat> Flavor, well, that's what it's all about, right? Flavor is so important on a tomato. The flavor of a tomato, like when you find the right tomato for you and you eat it, you could be like thrown back in time. You know, some magical barbecue in the 90s where you were poolside and had the best burger ever with this amazing tomato that was just pulled off the vine and sliced up at the barbecue. That's the tomato that's been like your gold standard for the last 30 years and you finally find it. But flavor is so unique and our taste buds are so diverse and individualized that prior to uh, 2020, so before COVID uh, kind of took a lot of our social gatherings and events away, we had an annual tomato tasting event where we would taste up to anywhere from 35 to 50 different varieties of tomatoes. Walking around with little toothpick samples and making notes and asking people to vote for their favorites. And what always amazed me is that if we tasted 50 varieties of tomatoes, close to 40 of those varieties would be voted for by at least someone as their favorite. So there's not a one. There's not like everyone loves Momotaro. It's just there. It's not that simple. This is why we have so many varieties to choose from. Red ones, yellow ones, round ones, oval ones, cherry ones, big ones. There's a huge range because we humans, they're so important to us. Tomatoes are so important and we're all looking for that flavor that brings us back to that wondrous moment where we tasted a homegrown tomato sometime in our life and, and had that almost, you know, religious experience. I'm sure, I'm sure that's happened to you. So flavor, the varieties make a big difference. Go to a tasting event. Hopefully we will be able to have them again now that we are uh, all more protected from this virus. But um, you'll find maybe even sampling at new seasons and read reviews of all of the different varieties of tomatoes. You may think that you know the flavor of a tomato, but maybe all you've ever eaten is the tomato that you can buy at the grocery store, which pales in color and pales in comparison to the range of flavors that you can find uh, from the varieties that you grow at home. Now, I already talked about watering a little bit, but know that watering can also affect the flavor of your tomatoes. Watering to over watering can actually kind of water down and dilute the intense flavor of your tomatoes. I like to at least pick my tomatoes 24, maybe 48 hours after the last watering. So I'm not gonna like water and then pick right away. I like to give them time between for those flavors to concentrate. And then again, don't store them in the refrigerator, very important. Now suggested varieties to try, I mean, if you come into the garden center 
Uh, from now, right now we have a great selection of tomatoes. I've got, you know, just pulled together. I don't know, what do I have? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, like 21 different tomatoes on here. There might be two early girls, so that, that's 20 different varieties of tomatoes. Um, a drop in the bucket of what we have in stock. Uh, I'd say we probably, I don't know, carry close to 40 or 50 varieties in the peak of the season. So by next week, we'll probably be peaking in tomato availability. Uh, and that's right about put you in time for your Mother's Day planting. Uh, study up, check our website, look for the suggested varieties uh, and, you know, maybe even look back on our tomato tasting results or come in and just ask uh, a one of our experts and you'll get lots of opinions on what we like or what's popular or what we grow. <clears throat> Suggested varieties that we give you on the handout for cherry varieties, Sun Gold, which is a extremely popular orange cherry tomato, very productive. Uh, ex people love this tomato and we grow it every year. Chocolate Cherry, another uh, of the black or, or brown style tomato. So a more complex flavor, but still really sweet. Isis Candy, a very small heirloom cherry tomato. Snow White, a wonderful ivory colored cherry tomato. And Golden Sweet, which is a, a really, again, nice yellow cherry tomato. And the range of colors even of just growing a bunch of different colored cherry tomatoes. If you slice those up for like a cherry salad, um, cherry tomato salad looks really pretty. Beef steak, which are like the large, put it on your hamburger, you know, slicer tomatoes, suggested varieties to try, brandy wine, mortgage lifter, pineapple or Hawaiian pineapple here, or a mana orange. But know that most beef steak tomatoes are a longer, uh, more days to maturity. So you're looking at uh, 70, 75, even on to 85, 95 days for maturity. So get yourself something that earlier is ripening as well. Medium slicers or saladette tomatoes, black crim for an heirloom, goliath for a hybrid, fabulous uh, flavor for both of those. Paste tomatoes that you want to um, use for canning or salsa or, um, you know, put up for paste. San Marzano, kind of the gold standard in flavor, or Roma, which we've all been familiar with for many years. And then the cold tolerant, extra early tomatoes. I don't have a crystal ball. I don't know if we're gonna end up with a hot, hot summer again, but it sure has been a cold spring, and it might be a good one to go with some early yielding and cold tolerant varieties. As I mentioned, Bloody Butcher, Moscovich, Stupus, fantastic for the cold tolerant varieties and then one that I don't see on my list but tomatoes to try in the smaller containers so if you've got um, you know you don't have the room to have a whole bunch of 20 gallon or excuse me 15 gallon 20 inch pots all over your patio or whatever uh, the compact or determinant varieties Willamette as I mentioned uh, Celebrity is another great one Oregon Spring, another compact form, one that's just called patio, which is what you put in a pot on your patio, right? These are determinate varieties that would be fine to grow in smaller pots, five gallon, 14 inch, something like that. And then in the pre in past years, I, I always try to grow, grow at least one new tomato. There's always new tomatoes. There's new tomatoes coming out on the market every year, which I mean, there's going to be a billion, trillion, bajillion tomatoes eventually, but I think some also kind of fall out of popularity and get harder to find and, you know, that kind of thing too. But this <clears throat> last year's or a couple years ago's new tomato was called Tumbling Tom. And Tumbling Tom uh, is a hanging basket style or cascading tomato. And it was pretty good. The flavor was pretty good. But I'm going to try this new cascading tomato, uh, new to me at least, and this one's called Cherry Falls. So Cherry Falls is, uh, so they call it semi-determinant, which means it's like short and compact. It's not viney, but it can cascade 36 to 40 inches. So it can grow down basically like three feet. Uh, I've also read a review that it kind of grew up about three feet in somebody's container. 
but you could put this on a hanging basket as long as you kept it more consistently watered. This is um, like one and a half inch juicy red cherry-like fruits, very productive, cherry falls. I would put cherry falls in something like, uh, this is a 12 inch, so like a 12 inch pot or maybe a three gallon container if you were comparing, again, one per, one plant into this pot um, and whether you hung that or just had that, you know, sitting, if it's going to cascade three feet, eventually we would need to like put it up on something so that it could spill down. But that still gives us enough soil volume to support all that growth instead of the smaller and smaller the pot, the harder it is to keep the plant watered and keep it happy. <clears throat> Again, everyone, lots and lots of information out there. If you have more questions, please do make comments and I will respond to them by the end of the day. Uh, come in soon, grab the attention of a staff member or look at our signs of uh, previous like award winners from our tomato tasting. What's been popular in the past will often be you know, popular to you as well. Um, and by all means, ask for our opinion because when it comes to tomatoes, Lots of us have them. Uh, always, thanks for watching, everyone. Happy gardening.